The Dirty Old Men of Pakistan Why does Pakistan hate the United States? People in Pakistan really, really don't like the United States. The most dangerous country in the world? Pakistan, the most dangerous spot in the world for Americans. What's 50 times more dangerous than Afghanistan? Pakistan, the endlessly troublesome ally. Islamicide, how the Mullah Mafia is destroying Pakistan. The terror problem from Pakistan. We're gonna talk about Pakistan. On August 5th, former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was convicted on contested corruption charges. He was sentenced to three years in prison and later barred from politics for five years. Khan's conviction came over a year after he became the first prime minister in the country's history to be removed through a parliamentary no-confidence vote in April 2022. Between then and now, Pakistan has arguably transformed into a more apparent military police state. Other protests were directed at one group, Pakistan's powerful military. More than 4,000 people detained. Journalists, commentators and analysts have also been arrested. Instability is going to grow in Pakistan. The developments have been startling, but have garnered a relatively restrained response in the American press, mirroring the response from the United States government. The United States does not have a position on one political candidate or party versus another in Pakistan or in any other country. The response has remained restrained, even as The Intercept recently revealed that high-ranking State Department employees privately threatened Pakistani officials that the country would face isolation if Khan remained in power. Even if those comments were accurate as reported, um, they in no way show the United States taking a position on who the leader of Pakistan ought to be. The U.S. news media has for decades failed in its reporting on Pakistan for a multitude of reasons, including its Orientalist imagining of an entire nation, but especially because of how rooted international coverage is in the dictates of U.S. foreign policy. And so we never see a critical eye on the role of American power, which has nothing to do with what's good for Pakistanis, but rather everything to do with Pakistan's ability to serve as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy in the region. Welcome to Backspace, where we tell you how the story is told in the headlines, and then we think about how we can tell it a little differently. Since the protests in May of this year following Imran Khan's arrest, thousands of Pakistanis have been arbitrarily arrested without charge. The use of anti-terrorism laws and military trials of civilians, which is against international law, has been put in place. Prominent journalists and activists have been arrested, and several others, including those abroad, have faced state harassment and charges of terrorism. One influential journalist, Imran Riaz Khan, is still missing three months after his arrest. Journalists in Pakistan have even been banned from discussing Imran Khan publicly, leading to ridiculous moments like this. Yeah, that amorphous blurred blob is him. And then there's Imran Khan's political party, Pakistan Tariq e Insaf, or PTI, which has been mostly dismantled official by official, party worker by party worker, in a series of public resignations. The resignations are believed to have resulted from government and military intimidation tactics, which include alleged abductions and threats. All of this culminated in the August conviction of Imran Khan and a five-year ban on his involvement in politics. And it's all been in the lead-up to the upcoming general election, leaving PTI, which has been vastly popular, weakened and basically the party non grata. Then, of course, there was the intercept drop with the leaked cipher showing U.S. pressure and preference for Khan's removal. Now, this all seems pretty significant, right? For this to happen in any country, but for this to happen in a country with such a global presence and influence, a nuclear power that has long been of geostrategic importance to the United States, it seems as though it necessitates sustained and in-depth coverage, right? While there have been bursts of coverage, overall the response has been muted, to put it gently. What we have seen hasn't engaged or investigated all the allegations made against the Pakistani government and military, or even the U.S. government itself. Allegations around U.S. interference in particular were instead met with skepticism and dismissed as merely conspiratorial. Khan had been leading a protest convoy across the country saying he was the victim of a conspiracy by the current prime minister and the United States. Khan claims his ouster is part of a Western conspiracy. So is the current government, an American implant. It, it's with the blessings 
And at the time of filming this, it's been a week since The Intercept's report on the leak dropped, and there's been next to no coverage or discussion in mainstream U.S. news about it, as well as any statement from members of Congress. In fact, we were able to locate just one piece from MSNBC editor Zishan Alim. Of course, none of this is novel, right? It's very much so in line with a long history of American news media engagement with Pakistan, which has been defined by a core feature of how U.S. mainstream news covers events abroad through the lens of U.S. foreign policy and that it is ultimately good. Since Pakistan's founding, the idea that it is a country, often a dangerous one, filled with irrationality, driven by uncertainty, always on the brink of collapse, has defined depictions of it. The State Department is ordering most U.S. citizens out of Pakistan as violent anti-Americanism spreads to that country. In the midst of this religious fervor, there are 50 million women who live as second-class citizens. Misery is their social mandate. Economic sanctions, though, threaten to make those problems a lot worse. Pakistanis may start wondering if nuclear power was worth it. There are decades of these depictions, but there's a real commitment to this narrative of the brink of collapse and dangerous nation that emerges post 9-11, and it's directly tied to U.S. foreign policy decisions and war crimes. During this time, Pakistan is working, or forced to, as some may argue, with the United States in the so-called war on terror but it is also simultaneously being victimized by it and accused of worsening it. In a war, you always have an adversary. And we have come to the conclusion that Pakistan is an adversary, both in Afghanistan, but also on global terrorism. Pakistan is an ally, a sovereign nation, but the U.S has killed hundreds of people inside its borders with drone strikes. John Brennan, the president's uh, counterterrorism advisor, says it's inconceivable that bin Laden didn't have some sort of support system in Pakistan. What happened? A 2020 media analysis by researchers in Pakistan that looked at U.S. news coverage of the country between 9-11 and 2019, focusing on the New York Times and Washington Post, found that of the 123 editorials published on Pakistan during that time frame, two-thirds were unfavorable. A 2017 analysis in the academic journal African and Asian Studies looked at the New York Times and USA Today over the course of one year, 2012 to 2013, and found that the framing of Pakistan in editorials and reporting was overwhelmingly negative across an array of subjects. One example of this unfavorable coverage that highlights what U.S. newsrooms routinely get wrong about Pakistan, including right now, is the belaboring on the point of so-called anti-Americanism. It's usually presented as though Pakistanis have an irrational level of hatred for the United States that lends itself to conspiratorial belief and violence. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Imran Khan's initial accusations of U.S. support behind his removal were not taken seriously by a U.S. media culture that sees Pakistanis as pathologically conspiracy-minded and anti-American. But those accusations have political currency among so many Pakistanis, especially because there's a very real history of U.S. intervention in Pakistan. Rarely is there an earnest and honest engagement with why there is so-called anti-American sentiment, or even what that anti-Americanism even means. Instead, anti-Americanism is presented as an all-encompassing hatred and is used to muster up particular political framings and media fodder. And it's lamented as an obstacle to U.S. foreign policy endeavors and goals in the country, endeavors and goals which are presented as necessary and never questioned. We're fools for giving somebody who hates right. our way of life and has been doing so many things to put us in jeopardy and to give them money. So-called anti-Americanism in Pakistan, however defined and measured, is never a moment for self-reflection. Because never mind the history of the United States supporting military coups in Pakistan or the spread of pro-U.S. propaganda in religious schools and mosques during the 80s via Saudi Arabia in order to muster up support for anti-Soviet fighters in Afghanistan. Never mind the countless covert CIA operations like vaccination drives that drove up distrust of vaccines in rural areas. Never mind the years of drone strikes in an undeclared war that claimed a still uncertain number of civilian casualties. Never mind that all males of a vaguely defined military age who were killed in those drone strikes were considered unlawful enemy combatants. Evidence be damned.
Clearly, at this moment, the relationship between Pakistan and the United States is spiraling down over the issue of the use of drones. Packaging Pakistani discontent with American war crimes, economic abuse, and support for destruction of domestic democratic institutions as simply, they hate us, is a purposeful neglect of American culpability. And that underscores why U.S. newsrooms fail in their coverage of Pakistan and Pakistanis every time, including now. Because bothering would mean taking a much closer and serious look at the U.S. government's support for the Pakistani military, now and in decades prior. And what we see time and time again is a reluctance within many newsrooms to confront the role of American political, economic, and military power in the destabilization of other countries. Now, that doesn't mean everything bad in Pakistan is because of American interference. But what's fundamental to understanding the relationship between the United States and Pakistan, like the relationship between the U.S. and so many other countries, is that it's not one of equals or even really allies. By consistently framing Pakistan as dangerous, as a country lost in religious zealotry, as a wasteland for women, and as always on the brink of collapse because nothing ever seems to go right there, including the weather, we lose the fundamental complexities that make up any country. Complexities we, to a large extent, are responsible for. So is it possible to reform American news coverage of Pakistan, especially when we see that that engagement at its root is tied to the machine of American foreign policy and relies on the idea that the country is fundamentally a burden, even if sometimes an ally? Well, it's complicated. Divorcing mainstream American news media, an institution, from the institutions of American power, like foreign policy, requires an entire remanufacturing of the news industry itself. And I can't do that. Sorry, guys. Well, not yet, anyways. But there are ways for newsrooms to at least move away from the regurgitation of the same damaging tropes that lock Pakistan and Pakistanis as a means to an end for U.S. foreign policy interests. First, there's who gets to speak on Pakistan as an expert. I spoke to Mohammed Zahir, a media critic and researcher at King's College London, who pointed out that it's as important to look at who is given the mantle of commenting on Pakistan as much as paying attention to what story is being told. There is this relationship between uh, politics and media that isn't necessarily uh, unique to Pakistan, but it, it's very important to be aware that it exists. Now what happens is that if you don't tow the party line, then you won't get opportunities to write for these media organizations. And when international organizations come into Pakistan looking for voices to talk about Pakistan, uh, they will obviously look at people's resumes and uh, people that work for legacy media will be at the top of the list. The danger of that is obviously that they will get narratives that tow a specific party line rather than what is reflective of reality. As we discussed in our previous episode on defense experts, it's crucial for newsrooms to be transparent about who they're using as experts on any given subject, as more often than not, the experts are actually people with vested interests, often financial, in certain outcomes. Then there's re-examining the type of stories that are picked about Pakistan, moving away from depictions that show us a country of scary, brown, bearded men, a society that hates women, a country plagued with poverty and environmental devastation. There's no doubt that Pakistan is a country that experiences problems at every level. Corruption, poverty, gender-based violence, environmental collapse, armed militants. These are all real things, absolutely. But when we present and understand these issues as pathological to Pakistan, as the only lens to understand the country, we create a caricature of a nation of 240 million people. Creating caricatures dehumanizes people, and dehumanizing people makes it easy to be dishonest about their history as it intertwines with ours, especially if you're a U.S. journalist in a U.S. newsroom. Caricatures allow U.S. newsrooms to rely on lazy ideas versus engaging with the role the U.S. has played in continuously destabilizing other countries for its own goals, countries like Pakistan. Instead, we end up with the careless accusations of anti-Americanisms and lamentations about the imminent collapse of a country that, through design, is kept from building itself up. The U.S. news media 
doesn't have to fail in its coverage on Pakistan. But until and unless it contends with the responsibility it has towards holding American power to account, it will continue to do so. Thanks so much for watching. So if you like Backspace, if you like how it's produced, if you like how it's edited, if you like the lighting, if you like the background, well, I'd like to introduce you to the man behind it all, Ahmed. He's gonna be unfortunately leaving the Backspace family, but we want to make sure that you got to meet him and also thank him in the comments. The situation in Pakistan is evolving really quickly. In fact, by the time this episode comes out, who knows where the country will be. But we wanna hear from you. What are some other countries, maybe the country that you're from, that have faced a similar treatment in US news media? Let us know in the comments and make sure you like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you soon, sooner.